a number of eminent people. We are here to discuss Dr. Nilanji Ghosh's very important paper. He is our director of the URF chapter. He is going to present his paper, Promoting a GDP of the Poor, the Imperative of Integrating Ecosystem Valuation in Developmental Policy. This is, as all of us know, a very, very important topic. For uh, way too long, countries have focused on pursuing economic growth at the cost of ecosystem services uh, and the ecosystem. So uh, I would not waste any more time and I would quickly give it over to Nilanjan. Nilanjan, your time starts now and you have 20 minutes to present your paper. Thank you, Malanchu, for the introduction. And uh, without much ado, in fact, since we are already late by around 10, 15 minutes, uh, get into the yeah, yeah just one last just one last comment i would request everyone uh, to put the questions in the chat box so that uh, you know the q and a can happen smoothly sorry nilanjan you can proceed now yeah sure. thank you thank you Malanjan. so uh, the fundamental idea for this paper eventually came up of course uh, when uh, i had been working on some of the case studies which uh, while advising uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature. Uh, essentially, uh, while, while working on that, what I found was there was a very strong dependency of uh, the poor, especially those with low incomes, on the critical services that are being provided by the ecosystem. Of course, this was there, in fact, in the works of uh, some of uh, our two very eminent panelists who are present here, Professor Kanchan Chopra and Professor Madhu Verma. Way back, in fact, this was, uh, uh, in fact, highlighted by Professor Chopra in his work, in fact, uh, in the 1990, when she brought out that uh, work with Professor Gopal Kadekori and Evan Murthy on participatory development and then eventually on many of the other protected areas. And uh, in fact, very, uh, pro over the last two decades, Professor Verma has also been emphasizing on it. And very recently, her Tiger Valuation Reports, uh, Tiger Reserve Valuation Reports were turned out to be extremely significant. But this entire co the coinage of this term, GDP of the poor, uh, came up with uh, one of the uh, 2009 or 2010 publications uh, by Pavan Sukhdev, in fact, uh, uh, in, in, in Nature, and where uh, Pavan essentially took up some of the critical services that the ecosystem are providing. Of course, these are the ones which are getting marketed in the process, mostly those provisioning services. And he found that around 57% of, uh, the, if, if we put a monetary value to the services, around 57% of the incomes of the poor are emerging from these ecosystem services. In the process, the concern that comes is what essentially are these ecosystem services? Of course, we have the biodiversity around us, which is providing us with a stock of capital, what we call the natural capital. And out of this natural capital eventually ensures that the ecosystem functions in its own inimitable organic way and provides the human community with uh, the services, services in the form of provisioning of clean water, decomposition of wastes, sequestering carbon, or even supposed to stocking up the carbon, and uh, eventually a host of other services like food, fishery, uh, pest control, and, uh, and, and what we call the supporting services in the form of uh, soil formation and, and, of course, biological control as well. So as the human system, we ourselves are dependent on the ecosystem, on the broader ecosystem, and this interaction. Uh, this is a very simplistic form, in fact, which is presented in this diagram. This entire interactivity of the human system and the ecosystem essentially delineates what we call the social ecological system. Of course, Eleanor Ostrom had a much more, it's a much more complicated phenomenon how this ACS works, but this is just for a, 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 an exposition that I'm putting across this diagram. So we have an ecosystem which has its own structure and functions. Then we have the human system, which is intervening on the ecosystem to extract some of these benefits. So in and around the protected areas or in and around an ecosystem, which might be a lake or a forest or a river basin at a broader scale, all you have is the human system is intervening to extract some of the goods and the services from the ecosystem. So these services can occur in the form of fuel, food, uh, fiber, then, of course, in the context of uh, pollution control, 
uh, in the context of uh, soil formation, recreation, uh, religious activities, and of course, uh, some very, very critical cultural services as well. Now, what we find is that the, especially the communities dwelling in and around a natural ecosystem, and especially the poor, they have a very high degree of dependency on the various goods and services provided by the ecosystem. So when we think about so when we think the kind about of time, uh, developmental activity, uh, which impedes on the working of the ecosystem, uh, what we often do not take into consideration, suppose if we think of a linear infrastructure like a bridge or a road, or suppose say it might be an infrastructure which essentially impedes on the flow of the river and completely changes the flow regime, then what we often lose out are some of the critical ecosystem services. So when you change the course of a river, uh, what, what might, or suppose you construct a dam, then what might be affected in the process is are the fisheries. What might be affected in the process are the entire flow regime, including the sediment flow, which probably has led to the soil formation in the delta. So over time, what we find is that dependency generally in diminishes with distance from the natural ecosystem. As also, in fact, when your economy or your incomes get more and more diversified and are dependent on other sectors. So these ecosystem services, what we find is that these are goods and services not only uh, provided by nature, not only free of cost, they're often devoid of market. Some of them might come in the market framework, but most of them are devoid of the markets. Naturally, they go unrecognized. And of course, there are free rider problems, which leads to the over exploitation of the ecosystem under consideration, impedes on the ecosystem functioning, and eventually can lead to the depletion of the ecosystem services. Now, in fact, uh, the way, in fact, uh, when uh, I, I thought of these various studies or the cases while over the last three, four years when advising WWF India, uh, we took this classification of, of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Uh, uh, Professor Chopra was, of course, a part of this entire assessment. And, uh, of course, there are many other assessments which came, in fact, later on the TEAB assessment. Then, in fact, uh, a host of uh, other ecosystem ag assessment and many others, which led to uh, you know modification of these classifications. But this is the fundamental classification which uh, have been accepted and turned out to be pretty robust. And the four broad classifications under which the ecosystem services occur uh, happen to be the provisioning services, which essentially is uh, it, it needs to be delineated from the perspective of the quantities. That is the production of food, water, medicinal plants, and so on and so forth. Then you have the regulating services of the ecosystem, which uh, uh, controls of uh, which controls climate, disease, uh, carbon sequestration, pest control, and a host of other things. Then you have the supporting service of the ecosystem, which is some kind of an umbrella service, which supports the various other ecosystem services, including the provisioning service, regulating service, and the cultural service as well. Well, when we talk about the cultural services, we talk about the spiritual and the recreational active, uh, benefits. Uh, we talk about tourism. We talk about uh, you know, the religious uh, dimension of the ecosystem services, the holy waters or the sacred groves, and many other things. Now, supporting service, which essentially includes uh, soil formation, the nutrient cycles, crop pollination, these are the services which essentially hold all other services. They are, the, they are the ones which are supporting the provisioning, regulating, and the cultural services. So as I was stating that human interventions, which are in the nature of uh, economic interventions or economic actions, they keep on altering the ecosystem structures. Now, when I think about growth and I think about short-term developmental uh, ambitions, then definitely what I am essentially losing out is the longer term dimension of development. So all I am not taking into consideration is that uh, there, in order to achieve short term development or short term growth, I might construct a dam or I might clear out the forest land or I might in fact destroy a wetland and eventually have real estate out there. But the long term costs are simply not taken into consideration in that piece. So this paper essentially brings about, talks about four cases by way of which, uh, three cases by way of which essentially uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, I'd like to emphasize on factoring in the critical values of the ecosystem services in our entire development paradigm. And that is how this entire dimension of the GDP of the poor also arises. So this has been happening. Uh, human interventions have been happening all across through land use changes by conversion of forests to other uses. Sorry. Nilanjan, can I please ask you to stop for a while and solve this problem? Both our uh, panelists cannot uh, uh, hear you and listen to you at all. And Dr. Madhu Verma can't even see you because I don't think we can go on with both the discussions uh, not being able to hear you. Can you just uh, stop for a while and can we fix this? Uh, okay, Akhil thinks there is an internet problem. Uh, okay, okay, sure. Okay. Okay. Okay, so various forms of okay. intervention. Okay, sorry, been... sorry, Nilanjan, yeah. Okay, let me just go ahead. Various forms of interventions have been happening in, fact, in the form of land use change, in the processes of urbanization and industrialization, leading to a release of effluents in air and water. And uh, of course, very, very critical things that keep on happening is the changes in the ecohydrological flows due to the constructions of the large structures. Uh, this, of course, uh, in one sense, you know, restricts the movement of fish, fishes in the process, uh, you know, the fishermen community farther downstream, they get affected. On the other hand, what we have are, of course, uh, the, the entire sedimentation or the, or the sediment flow regime, sediment regime by itself changes. So there are a host of concerns which essentially affects. So results of this human interventions, uh, you know, I mean, we find in fact in the lower Colorado Delta, uh, where essentially the central Arizona project, when it was uh, led to diversion of the Colorado and eventually constru large scale constructions in the in, in, in the desert area of Arizona, uh, led to uh, you know stream flow depletion and eventually that also uh, there was sea level rise in the delta, especially because Colorado is, is a transboundary river flowing uh, from the United States to uh, Western United States to uh, Mexico, and there was salinity ingression. This led to uh, you know, destruction to a certain extent, I'll call it destruction of the entire paddy cultivation in lower Colorado. To a certain extent, we witnessed the same kind of a phenomenon happening in the Indian Sundarbans Delta. I'll come to that later in one of the cases. So why do we essentially need to value these ecosystem services? We know that a large body of literature is emerging and uh, more importantly, the valuation or the monetary valuation of ecosystem services, they offer somewhat an objective instrument for decision making. They raise uh, public awareness of the market and the policymakers on the uh, importance of the ecosystem services under consideration. They help legal proceedings to determine damages where a party is held liable for causing harm to another party. Suppose a pollution from upstream areas or suppose a diversion, water diversion or uh, 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 in the upstream areas can affect the downstream negatively. In the process, it can also help in designing uh, compensation policies for the judiciary or for uh, whosoever. It can in the process, if it we plug, suppose when we think of an investment, uh, larger investment project in the, in the context of linear infrastructure, at times, we often think of, uh, of the entire cost benefit matrix. And uh, over time, uh, you know, when you plug in these values of ecosystem services as the cost that the society has to bear, in that case, you might even like to revise your investment decisions. So uh, certain decisions which might turn out to be, uh, uh, to, be, to be viable in the short run might not be viable in the long run. So it is not merely a concern or a conflict between our uh, economic goals and the sustainable development goals or bringing in the ecosystem in the in entire uh, cost benefit analysis metrics, but it has a bigger dimension. The bigger dimension is the conflict between the short run and the long run. So let me just come to uh, the case one uh, of this paper, which is valuation of the Kunigal wetlands, which uh, happens to be a peri-urban wetland in the south in the state of Karnataka, uh, near the Tumpur district, it's a lake. 
uh, which has a spread of around 416 hectare area and the gross storage capacity is 532 million cubic feet. The lake is primarily fed by the Hemavati River and of course the rainwater. The catchment, this is the land use uh, land cover map uh, of the taken in 2013. It has the fallow land, crop land, the built up land, the water bodies. Then we have the scrub forest, open forest and barren and open land as well. So we chose only a few ecosystem services out here. There was this plan of uh, essentially, you know, having some kind of an investment out there, set up a factory. But when we thought of that, what if suppose such an intervention happens, what might be the cost that the economy has to bear or suppose that the local economy has to bear? Because in any case, the local economy or the villages uh, in that particular region, they were reliant on this particular ecosystem. So we just chose a selected few, few ecosystem services, uh, uh, so which included water for agriculture, domestic uh, water use, uh, fisheries, fodder, water quality regulation, carbon sequestration, microclimate regulation. And what we found was, of course, this value is there that uh, of 1030.45 million INR, which is a very, very conservative estimate, only considering a few ecosystem services. To, there is, uh, in fact, a potential for religious tourism out there, but this has not developed. So we also estimated potential for religious tourism, which was uh, to the uh, tune of 159.37 million INR with uh, a revenue uh, potential of uh, 137 million INR. And what we devised, uh, in fact, was the ecosystem dependency index or the ecosystem dependency ratio, which is essentially the value of the ecosystem services and the uh, how, uh, household in, uh, and the ratio of the value of the ecosystem services and the household income. Because the uh, people out there are essentially rural and poor, what we found was even with this very few ecosystem services, the ecosystem dependency ratio is 1.24. That means the community out there earns 24% more income from the ecosystem than what they're earning from the formal economic or the informal economic setup. So this creates a clear case for conservation and also creates a case on what we call the GDP of the poor. So the second case is that of the Terai Arc landscape, uh, which is uh, in fact uh, spread across Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Uh, we chose the Uttarakhand part of the Terai Arc landscape, which uh, consists of uh, seven districts and four protected areas. Uh, the extent of the Tal is 18,496 square kilometer. Uh, so this happens to be the overall map consisting of the various districts. Here we also we chose, this was at a bigger scale, that was only at the scale of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a wetland, this is at the scale of a landscape. So we also chose here very few ecosystem services to look at how things are moving over time. And so this was some kind of a how the ecosystem services have also changed over time and how ecosystem dependency has also changed over time. That is what we wanted to check in here. So we tested, for, uh, we essentially tried to evaluate the, uh, get the values of water for agriculture, water for hydropower. We have the Ramganga project, in fact, in that region, carbon sequestration, uh, water, uh, drinking water, tourism, microclimate regulation, Quillwood, fodder, religious tourism as a cultural service. These are very few selected. It's not that they're exhaustive, very, uh, very, very conservative estimates. And uh, we had uh, this particular value of 2275. 17.28 million INR. Uh, in 2015-16, this value was US dollar 6 billion. Interesting aspect was that, that uh, in 2005-06, the total income of the Tal districts, uh, I, I mean, the ecosystem dependency ratio was 1.19. But over time, what we found was that the urbanization is happening in that particular landscape. And the incomes are also getting more and more diversified with industrial incomes and service incomes becoming more and more prominent. So the ecosystem dependency ratio has been declining. So it declined to 0.52 in 2011, 0.41 in 2015. But even then, one cannot ignore the fact that ecosystem services add was adding up 40% more benefits to the earnings of the local community. So uh, this is where the ecosystem dependency of the, of course, the, if we consider only the poor community, the ecosystem dependency is going to be substantially higher than this. Now, this is a very, very, the case three happens to be a very critical case of the Indian Sundarbans Delta, where we have been, we essentially uh, tried to incorporate uh, uh, the values of the ecosystem services in the context of entire development planning rather in the context of adaptation planning, to be more precise. Uh, 
Uh, this was a vision 2050 of Indian Sundarbans Delta, which was uh, envisaged and conceived of by WWF India, uh, especially after the ILA of uh, 2009. The idea was that, that uh, there are demarcated uh, vulnerable zones uh, and eventually uh, what was conceived of by a team consisting of Dr. Anurag Dondo, uh, Professor Jayanto Bandopadhyay and Professor Shubato Hajra and Ravindranath Bhattacharya and others that you simply cannot make people stay there in vulnerable zones. Uh, rather, it became even more amplified after the Amphan that happened recently. In fact, these zones are simply not livable, not only because of the intensity of the extreme events, but also because of the sea level rise. So their idea was that if by 2050, through there can be managed and strategic retreat, which is now being uh, talked of as a very viable plan of adaptation, when in situ adaptation fails, and this is one region where in situ adaptation has been failing. So as the population migrates to the newly developed areas, uh, the idea is that the vacated area should be restored for, uh, for mangrove forest and future investments should focus on ecosystem res uh, restoration. So in the process, if ecosystem restoration happens, then we are going to have a few other ecosystem services, so which can consist of carbon sequestration, fishery production, storm surge protection, because mangroves help in uh, storm surge protection as well, tourism, honey, prawn larva, crab as a provisioning service. So uh, what we found was that between 2050 to 2020, the current values of the expected benefits in under the business as usual scenario, uh, considering the fact that the sea level is rising at the rate of around eight to 12 millimeters uh, per year over the last decades. Uh, this was the ex total expected uh, current value of the flow of benefits. And when we thought of the new scenario, where in fact people are moving to the newer area and they are reskilled, there are costs incurred in the form of capital expenditure, in the form of operations and maintenance, and in the process, uh, service sector employment gets generated, also the costs are taken for that, then you have a host of sunk costs as well. Uh, what we find war is that the Vision 2050 scenario is 12.86 times more value than the business as usual scenario which creates a clear case for essentially managed and strategic retreat of the population, which, which is conceived of as an organic movement, not really as, uh, as, as a planned movement by the government. So uh, with that, in fact, let me just also emphasize on the GDP of the poor notion. This is what Sukhdev, in fact, conceived of in 2009. That, uh, uh, in the, in the case of the classic uh, GDP, the ecosystem services essentially entail barely 7%. And this is, of course, the marketed part. But when you take uh, into consideration the, uh, the GDP of the poor, only 57%, actually it's more if we take into consideration, you know, the other indirect, other values which are not marketed, not, I'm just talking of the direct values. But when you take the other indirect values also, in the, I mean, indirect services and indirect values into consideration, it it's actually exceeds the GDP of the, or the incomes of the poor. So this essentially creates a case on why we should bring in the notion of uh, valuation of ecosystem services in the development planning paradigm. So uh, GDP of the poor entails uh, the various sources of nature from which the poor in the developing and the non underdeveloped world draw their means of livelihood. And in this paper, what we try to do is to offer a numerical measure of this economic dependency of communities, define it as ecosystem dependency ratio or index, uh, which is essentially the sum of the values of ecosystem services and total incomes of the ecosystem or landscape. So what are the few development policy implications out of this? First of all, of course, understanding the trade-offs between conservation and development. It's not only the trade-off between conservation and development, but it is also the trade-off between the long run and the short run. That is the short run myopic economic growth. And of course, the long run uh, ecosystem concerns when the ecosystems and livelihoods are inextricably linked with each other. Of course, uh, this helps in rationalizing finance for development and of course, sustainable development financing as well. So it provides the option to development financial institutions and banks to incorporate these figures in their decision support systems. Uh, more importantly, this brings in the concern of equity even more prominently in development policy thinking. 
So, uh, so and more importantly, comparative values of ecosystem services across similar landscape with different institutional and governmental structures help in understanding the mode of institutional structure that helps in the best results for the ecosystem as well as development in relation to the local community. And more importantly, as in fact, I'm sure that uh, Professor Chopra and Professor Verma is def uh, they will definitely be talking about that valuation of ecosystem services creates the case for payment for ecosystem services and institutional mechanism, which uh, of course uh, is, is is becoming more and more essential for uh, you know sustainable development financing and bringing in the equity concern in the entire development paradigm, as also in fact the sustainability concern as well. But of course, this needs other enabling conditions, that is identification of the marketable ecosystem service, then identification of the entire uh, uh, sub service value chain, identification of the beneficiaries, identification of the benefactors, as well as the upstream ecosystem managers. So uh, with that, I'd like to stop here. Thank you for giving me 20 minutes. Thank you, Malanjo. Welcome, Nilanjan. You've left us all much more educated than we were. It is definitely a very, very good paper, very well researched. And some of the conclusions that you have in terms of the policy recommendations are really very important. Now I would turn to our eminent uh, discussions. Now we have with us um, Professor Kanchin Chopra and Dr. Madhu Varma. Both do not need any introduction. And uh, uh, Professor uh, Kanchin Chopra, she was the director and professor at the Institute of Economic Growth. People like me have grown up reading her papers. I would first call her upon to give her view. Hello, ma'am. Can you hear us? She's muted. Hello. Okay, I shall then turn to Dr. Madhu Varma. Dr. Madhu Varma? Yes. Yes. Hello, Dr. Varma. Uh, she is uh, the Chief Economist at the World Resources Institute. Thank you so much, ma'am. May I request you to please share your views on the London case? Well, uh, thank you very much, first of all, Nilanjan, for putting up uh, your cases together and coming out with a very, very interesting and useful uh, occasional paper. In fact, we uh, both of us echo the same kind of, you know, I would say sound, I wouldn't say noise, but, you know, we are. Uh, raising sort of, you know, uh, levels of our communication to let uh, people understand that the people sitting across the table, like policymakers, you know, uh, get larger body of knowledge and, you know, use our information for taking it forward in terms of what Lanjan concludes uh, his study with, you know, uh, kind of instruments, economic instruments in the system. So uh, any, any uh, it's, it's very well done, uh, Nilanjan. I'm aware of all the work that he has been doing in the past, in fact, had a chance to interact also with him closely, you know, some of the works that we have done in the past. It is very interesting to connect, you know, and highlight the GDP of poor is a con I mean, concept which came into being uh, almost 11 years ago and very much requires greater attention in the system. And so, so paper is very timely that we are highlighting this particular component and uh, uh, not, just not just, you know, making kind of a trade-off case of conservation versus development, but conservation uh, and, and development of both mutually reinforcing kind of, so that's, that's what kind of in a model we have to put in front and uh, my own experience of working with the last three finance commissions and making a case of forestry sector where we highlighted the value of contribution of forestry sector in the economy. We were able to, you know, uh, not just bring in an amount of grant, but in the 14th finance commission, influence the finance commission to develop a whole formula where 7.5 percent weightage was given to forestry sector, and this time it has increased to 10 percent for this particular year. So this kind of you know arguments are very very you know uh, I would say influential, uh, very thought provoking in the circles of policymakers. And I am I could also see over the years how receptive policymakers are becoming to the uh, research outcomes. So uh, I'm I'm very happy. You know, uh, uh, Niranjit has been doing uh, this is what we also have been doing in the past you know 30 years or 35 years more of action and policy research. So it is, it is an example of action and policy research uh, and uh, trying to build a case of, you know, uh, uh, seeking conservation finance for, you know, these uh, landscapes, these ecosystems, definitely. 
but i would also like to you know a uh, uh, couple of things uh, which might also further enrich your paper uh, you can also add a value in terms of cost of conservation of these you know uh, ecosystems we talk about flow of benefits but there's al always a cost of conservation and that's why you know uh, and also uh, in some some of the areas uh, we do have some restrictions of extraction because we have uh, a directive from the supreme court as well so uh, i mean even those areas can also be looked into but but if, to to maintain this flow of services in a in a perpetual manner we need to invest suitably so like uh, we just did a webinar on investing in nature conservation as a response to covid 19 so that's what we were just trying to build the case that uh, to convincing policy makers yes it does make sense to invest in you know natural capital not just we talk about investing in physical financial intellectual and social capital but it makes huge sense to invest in natural capital because without that nothing would come to us for any kind of development and activity so i think that that cost calculus if you can also built into your you know cases what cost goes into the system to maintain these ecosystems it's quite possibly these systems might be degraded you know because some of them you said that uh, in, in the second case you found that the values are declining when you worked on the ecosystem dependency ratio so uh, what what takes to actually not just compensate people for uh, their efforts but also what goes into rebuilding the system we're talking about building back better these days so it's a high time and very prime time and opportune time to talk about that kind of investment so also proportioning out the amount of investment required to you know uh, rebuild the systems are degraded and uh, to to maintain these systems is that not just you have the current flow of you know uh, services but in the next scenario 2050 vision maybe a larger flow of services from these you know bases so it would be i think you know, a good comparison good value that you can put in also bit of you know not not adding much to you but uh, to your uh, to your play to add further on in your study but also to make a case of a sort of you know uh, payment for ecosystem services we must map these values in the accounting framework you know uh, so uh, uh, in terms of stocks and flows in terms of the direct and indirect in terms of changes occurring across the whole year so if, if a simple calculus not much, not much complicated which is actually would be very complicated if you go for input output based kind of you know calculus but a simple calculus to us on this time how you know uh, what what are the what are the stocks what are the flows and what is what is required to connect them and that's how we'll work out the value of your desired finance for that particular purpose like we have actual accounts we have got you know flow, flow accounts we have got potential accounts and we have got connecting account which talk about the financial you know kind of thing so i think uh, that would further add value to it and one more you know experience which i have had uh, in terms of using this terminology payment for ecosystem services you know because people are accustomed you began your paper with saying that i mean people are extracting values are using but they're not aware of the use value of you know these ecosystem services because they're not paying to any market there's no market exists for them rather so best example is given for oxygen cylinders so everybody knows about that people are getting free oxygen from forest but if you are in a ventilator you require oxygen and you pay for oxygen then so that is a kind of value of oxygen which exists so that that if that you if you can build into that kind of you know thing would be very very useful uh, in your paper so for uh, so for what we think when we say payment people think that they have to pay for it it's not just you know but we are talking about only the beneficiaries we also we are talking more about the providers payment for ecosystem services definitely lies on the shoulders of the users of the benefits which which also has to be has to come into being because they are getting things free so how much can be assigned to you know maybe in terms of enhanced taxes and enhanced uh, kind of a, a payment by them in terms of maybe cess or whatever you know they are uh, they are otherwise paying uh, not not paying for any ecosystem service but we're talking more from the point of view of the provider of the service so they don't pay they receive the payment so it becomes a kind of incentive based mechanisms for these receivers the providers of the service So we did a study in in the Palampur catchment long ago. I think more than fourteen years ago, we tried to look into the payment for ecosystem services over the upstream, downstream kind of you know uh, uh, watersheds and, and the user communities. And we realized that we must use a better terminology in Indian context because users don't have to pay; they have, they have to pay, but providers have to receive something. And there's an incentive should be there for them to conserve an ecosystem. So if you can use that terminology in your paper, it will further add value to you. that's what i want to contribute congratulations very good paper and then gives a nice comparison of three different you know uh, landscape uh, wetland 
of course, the Rudraya plant and the Sundarbans, which is such a uh, challenging site. And uh, of course, we uh, I take a lot of your input in my own work of Sundarbans. So it, it's, it's really very useful to provide this kind of framework, especially in Sundarbans, which, which we proved through our own study in Tiger Reserves for Sundarban Tiger Reserve. So it receives the entire waste of Calcutta City, and there's a wonderful function of waste assimilation. But nobody pays for Sundarban Tiger Reserve, you know, management for doing this kind of wonderful function. Bangladesh receives entire, you know, fish stock because we provide nursery function in our own Sundarban, you know, domain. And fishes, when they grow up, they flow towards, you know, Bangladesh region. So these kinds of things, you know, would add further value and uh, use these terminologies and use these calculus to further, you know, substantiate our argument for convincing policymakers to providing better finance, better investment, recognition of these services, first of all, in our uh, environmental accounting, economic accounting calculus, which need to be combination of environmental economic accounting kind of a calculus. So thank you very much for having me here. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your suggestions. And can we now move to Professor Chopra, if she can hear us? Hello, ma'am, can you hear us? No. We seem to have completely lost her, which is very unfortunate. She seemed um, to be online. I could see her name in the list yeah. of panelists. Yes, her name is there. She also. Uh, let me just type out. Hello, ma'am. Hello, Professor Chopra. Okay, so we seem to have lost her and uh, technology is not on uh, our side today. So let's just move on to the audience. At this point of time, I have um, Lena Chandan Vadia who has a uh, question. And her question is, are governments showing willingness to respond to such findings? and halt development or change development plans as needed. I think this is a tough one, Milanjan. Would you like to go? Or you want we, another question? Should we? Yeah, I think it's better that if we can yeah, have yeah. a few more questions. So we have another question here from Dikshit Gupta. And uh, his question is, ecosystem services, as per the conversation, works in a sustainable way only if there is a cap on production. However, while this might add to exclusivity, it also attracts more sellers from outside, producing the same through assembly line production, making it difficult for them to survive. What is your perspective solution to this situation? I suggest that Nilanjan, you take these two. Yes. And, yeah. so let me take up uh, Alina's question maybe first. Uh, See, in fact, uh, of course, uh, uh, Professor Verma has been working with the government quite closely for quite some time. Professor Chopra has also been advising the government. Uh, previously, she has advised the government. The fact remains that, yes, there is quite a bit of interest, in fact, in the Ministry of Environment and Forests. But see, the fa important issue is that, which I have always noted, is the Ministry of Environment and Forest and the Ministry of Finance or uh, suppose say uh, the Ministry of Commerce and other ministries, they are they all work in silos. So it is extremely important that uh, these were consideration by the Ministry of Finance as well. Suppose say when you are presenting the budget, why don't you at least have a green budget taking into consideration some of these critical values? So uh, that doesn't happen. And it so happens that, uh, you know, at some point in time, Ministry of First Wave, I mean, a decade back, when Ministry of Environment and Forest was thought of as a disruptive ministry, precisely because it uh, stopped quite a few projects um, because they were not really eco-friendly. So so uh, important issue is that that when it comes to uh, the MOEF, they use these values. In fact, uh, one of the best tiger valuation uh, studies was done by uh, Professor Verma. In fact, very recently, so 2015 was the first first tranche came out, and subsequent tranches, of course, came out after that. But uh, the concern is, can MOEF essentially affect 
Ministry of Finance. But the Finance Commission now intends to take up some of these values, which, uh, uh, in fact, uh, I presume that when this uh, summit was held, uh, probably last August or September, I think, uh, when the Himalayan states asked for a green bonus, I wrote an op-ed on that. I, uh, Professor Verma probably provided that formula to them, uh, if I'm not wrong. So, uh, so in, uh, at that point in time, this entire green bonus that was asked for was uh, essentially uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, an idea where you were integrating, uh, you, know, you know, the entire developmental, uh, I mean, the these ecosystem concerns in your developmental philosophy. So, uh, I think Professor Chopra is back. Is it? Yes, he is back, but she still can't uh, you. Can't hear. So Nilanjan okay. has to finish answering the question while she's okay. still trying to figure it out. Uh, let me go to Mr. Dikshit Gupta's question. Uh, if I understand this question, especially the second uh, second sentence, that is, it might add to exclusivity. It also attracts more sellers from outside, producing the same through assembly line production, making it difficult for them to survive. Indeed, at times, this uh, adds to the cost. This is something that Professor Verma has uh, has been stating in fact, the cost of conservation. But on the other hand, when we think about uh, uh, issues of uh, you know bringing in uh, the concerns of the ecosystem and then environment and then that production line this can this can add up to the cost uh, however what often turns out to be uh, you know this is essentially the difference between uh, what we call the private optima and the social optima so when i am thinking of it socially and taking a long term perspective your long term profitability enhances the many studies have shown that that your long-term profitability enhances when you bring in the proper ecosystem concerns by putting in these long-term values in your entire uh, profitability metrics as well so uh, why essentially some of the firms in the developed world are thinking of uh, getting into you know i mean uh, greening up their production as well as their assembly lines as also their supply chains this is essentially the idea they're thinking in the longer term so it's not only, in fact, creating a brand for yourself, it is also with uh, essentially sustainability is turning out to be an important corporate strategy. And now sustainability is, doesn't mean that you just create a sustainability department in your own organization. But it is something like uh, uh, integrating what uh, essentially uh, uh, Michael Porter calls uh, shared value creation. Shared value creation CSV by itself integrates the notion of sustainability in the supply chain. Okay, thank you, Nilanjan. We'll make the last try to get Dr. Chopra in. Uh, Dr. Chopra, can you hear us? I think we've lost her again. That's quite unfortunate mm. because she came in. Uh, Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Nice to have you. Please uh, Finally, go ahead. Can you see me and can you hear me? I lost you. We can hear you, ma'am. We can hear you. I had introduced you before uh, we could hear you. So we have uh, Professor Chopra now. She. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Hello. She was. Uh, she yeah. was the director uh, at the Institute of Economic Growth. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us. We really look forward to your views. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Melancha. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for asking me to be here. And I looked at this paper. I have, of course, been 
in touch with Nilanjan work for a long time now. This is a very exhaustive and perceptive view of ecosystem services in three different parts of the country. It reiterates, of course, the imperative for such valuation in the first part. Uh, somewhere I got the impression that the economic values are put in opposition to the ethical and ecological values. Wouldn't it be better if these are treated as though they supplement each other in different policy contexts? So just think of that, that's just a suggestion that economic values are good. They provide us very important inputs into policy. But at times, they need to be supplemented by looking at the larger ethical framework. And all policymakers do look at the larger ethical and conservation-oriented framework. That being said, I was very sort of, I saw that there are three different uh, uh, ecosystems from a wetland system in the south of India to the Terai Arc and then to the Sundarban. And we have an exhaustive kind of uh, an estimate. Of course, one can get into small things about the why we've added, why we have added things that have been done in different methodological ways. I'll not go into all that because from a policy perspective, I see that these kinds of studies are really important and they need to give us a kind of an insight into how do we understand the contribution of nature to our economy? Now, the one point which I would like to uh, bring into the fore is that GDP of the poor. Now, you have uh, postulated that ecosystem services, the composite value of ecosystem services which we call the GDP of the poor. Uh, I have a small problem with that, and I'm sure you're aware of it, but I'll just make the point here. Not all ecosystem services accrue to the people in that region. So uh, some of them, like watershed services, go accrue to the people downstream. Some others, like carbon sequestration. My major problem actually is with carbon sequestration. Should it be a part of the GDP of the poor? In our report to the Supreme Court, you remember a long time ago, which later Madhu Verma had updated in 2013, we had said that the general principle for sharing between different stakeholders. There are different stakeholders to whom the ecosystem services of you. 100% of the fuel wood for the provisioning services are a part of the GDP of the poor. No contesting that point. But when it comes to watershed services, only 50% go to the poor of that region. And the, rest, the other 50% may be accruing to the downstream people who may be rich farmers. So that kind of identification of the stakeholders and carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration in the soil may help that region. But does it accrue to the poor? So that's a question mark. And from that follows my, uh, my question on the ED, the dependency ratio then. It follows from that. So actually, 
all that I'm trying to say is that you are on the right track, but somewhere down the line, we have to distinguish between which part of the ecosystem services appeal to the rich, which appeal to the nation state, which are global, a global good. That kind of a distinction has to enter into this analysis. This is just a further refinement of an analysis which I consider to be a very exhaustive and well-researched one, especially for the Sundar one. In the case of the Sundar one, I think the adaptive strategy that you talk about is really something that the government should be paying a great deal of attention to. In particular, in the context of the last, uh, the, uh, um, the cyclonic, uh, the last cyclone that we had, the storm that we had in West Bengal, it's called Ampi Pond. What was it called? I forget the name. And I saw also your work in the uh, your publications talking about these things at, at an, in different uh, in the Indian Express and different places. So uh, all I'm saying is that the adaptation strategy is very good. We have to move out of the Sundar funds and leave that area to itself. Again, I'm sure in the details, you have taken care of the discounting over a period of time because it has to be, and that kind of time period, 20, 50, 20, onwards, it's really the long, long time period. Could we look at the adaptation up to 2050? This is another question. I'm sure you've done that scenario. What happens between 2030 and 2050? Then beyond 2050, to my way of thinking, and I'm sure to the government, would seem too far off, too far off. So we have to give them a shorter run view of this. And then I'd like to say uh, one last point to reiterate the need for such studies, to reiterate the fact it is indeed a large part of the ecosystem services have a role to play in the PES kind of payment for ecosystem services especially in states and the recent concave and also how the Finance Commission is now taking into account all these things in their calculations. But uh, we have also to go a little beyond ecosystem services and look at the resilience of the social ecological system. And that's what we are doing in the case of the Sundar Fund. So I was really sort of, I'm very uh, happy to look at that study, the Sundar Fund's adaptation strategy. But of course, the big question remains, will government think about it? That is, governments are really sort of focused on the short run. And then to reiterate that somewhere we have to understand that economic systems are embedded in nature economies need to function within the biosphere and we have to learn to limit the human enterprise to save to the safe operating space for humanity as a self input. And to do this we have to embed the ecosystem services within the social ecological system of that region. So the Sarai Arc area study, for instance, can be similarly looked at. What is the what is the optimal, for lack of a better word, I'd say, optimal level of dependence of the poor on the ecosystem? Madhu also raised some of the, the, these issues because I think. Uh, let me say that the uh, poor depend on ecosystems. Over time, this has to change. 
this may change over time. And what does that change mean for the development planning in the country? Those are the kinds of issues. You have talked of a change over time in the Sarai uh, art area. What does that mean for the development planning in that region? An extension on the lines of the Sundarban study, perhaps. There again, we need to go back. We need to uh, not to extend human enterprise into certain spaces where it will lead to an even greater intensification of natural disasters. That's all that I would like to say. And thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. That's it, Malansha, I finished. That's it. Could you hear me? Could you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, we can all hear you. Could you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah I finished. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Malansha, you're inaudible, it seems. You have to unmute yourself. Hello, yes. So, uh, Nilanjan, I'll give you five minutes to respond to all comments, but I want yes, to request uh, Mr. John Tobondopadhyay to just make his uh, uh, intervention. Can I request him, sir? Are you there for us? Hello, sir. Hello. I can see him in the. Yes, I saw him in the. No, he's not there, it seems. I think he's just left because I saw him in the okay. list of attendees. So, doesn't matter, Nilanjan, I would give oh, you sure. five minutes to just uh, put everything together and maybe, if possible, uh, uh, you know, uh, respond to our distinguished uh, discussions also. Sure. I think uh, some of the some very very important interventions have come from uh, both Professor Verma and Professor Chopra, especially in fact uh, on the issue of cost of inter. Uh, let me come to Professor Verma's comment on the cost of interventions. This is something that in fact presently I'm working on, on what might be the cost of essentially regenerating this process, just as you stated, for the Terayak landscape. Yes, indeed. In fact, it's a landscape which is now in kind of encountering large-scale urbanization and in the process the ecosystem uh, services the values are diminishing on the one hand not only that even the denominator in the ecosystem dependency index that is income that is also increasing from the other sources so that is more so because you know uh, industrialization is happening there is a huge growth in service sector income in that particular region so i uh, let me just integrate uh, professor chopra's comment in here that when we have been talking of this time frame between 2005 and 2015, we are already finding that this change is happening in the developmental forces through other means. So the incomes have grown up, urbanization has been happening. So the ecosystem dependency of the overall ecosystem dependency of the community as such has declined. But what about what we couldn't do in that particular paper is uh, what is the, uh, as far as the poor is concerned, we simply couldn't distinguish in terms of income classes. We will do that. We plan to do that. Rather, I plan to do that in future. And maybe look at uh, the ecosystem dependency index, especially of the poor, in and around the protected areas or even beyond the protected areas. So possibly that will, uh, to a certain extent, uh, you know, uh, address this issue of uh, who is essentially dependent on the ecosystem and the issue of distribution from the perspective of the services on the one hand. The other thing, in fact, uh, on the why we, whether we should have uh, some global commons, global common good, like carbon sequestration. That's the, if, if uh, I mean, carbon emission is a global common bad, then I'm calling it the global common good as far as the service is concerned. Whether we should incorporate that on this element, we uh, rather I had a few debates and discussions and thinking. In fact, uh, when this study was uh, essentially conducted way back in 2014 only, 
So later on, in fact, when I was adding this up or writing this paper very recently, I also had this idea whether I should. Then the idea was if it is in the nature, is it in the nature of a public good? That is the big question. If it is in the nature of public good, then whether the poor or the rich, both of them, I mean, it's non-excludable in terms of the services. So uh, whether we should use this up as an indirect value or a direct value, that remains the question now. So uh, probably, uh, in fact, I might need to discuss this more. In fact, maybe at some point in time with you, both of you, that uh, how do we, uh, because EDI is a new concept. It has not been used in the literature so far. This is the first time that uh, I used it through an indexation. So this needs, you know, better articulation as well. So whether we should only use the direct values of whatever is entering into the market and the non-market framework, or we should in fact incorporate also the some of the indirect values if they are in the nature of the common goods. So, uh, so that is something that uh, possibly needs more deliberation in that case. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, on in, on the on the issue of the Indian Sundarbans Delta, Professor Chopra. In fact, uh, if you recall, this was a report which possibly you might have read earlier, but. but uh, what happened between 2020 and 2050 when I re-estimated these values recently is we also, I also took into consideration some of the shocks that might happen, some of the other scenarios. The scenarios are what might be the changes in the demography and the movements. Suppose say if the population moves between uh, say 20, 50 plus 25 percent of the population moves because already there is a movement happening. Uh, Initially, when the study was conducted in 2012, I presume that uh, I mean people were moving out of the Indian Sundarbans Delta because of lack of opportunities. Of between 2012 and 2019, when I was uh, looking at this particular study and re-estimating the figures, uh, all I could say is people were moving out for both the reasons. Of course, there are better opportunities elsewhere, whether it is in Kolkata or Delhi or Chennai or Kerala or even in the Middle East. And also because of the fact that some the next generation doesn't want to stick to the land because it's an agrarian economy primarily. And they don't want to stick to the land. They are moving out. And there have also been, which uh, I don't know whether Dr. Dondo is there in the audience, but he can uh, tell us. But it's also because there is also this phenomenon of, uh, you know, some places are becoming unlivable. People are also moving out because of that. Unlivable and you simply cannot uh, pr have a proper income or agriculture is no more possible. Even uh, fisheries are getting disrupted. So naturally, the better service sector opportunities are emerging, in fact, in the towns and the cities elsewhere. So this intersectoral movement entails the spatial movement as well. So, uh, so between 2020 and 2035, if uh, there are certain assumptions that we made that probably 25% of the population is moving out, especially taking the age cohorts, especially the youth. It's the youth which has a tendency to move out of that particular region rather than the old who want to stick to the land. So uh, then in fact, between 2035 to 2050, possibly if that is a hypothetical scenario, that uh, uh, this age cohort doesn't remain anymore and many of them move out. What happens to that region? So now the values that have been presented here are of two extreme scenarios that the business as usual is happening. And if at all, this uh, the best scenario, best case happens that people are all moving out, then we have, we of course took a discount rate of, uh, if I recall, it was 8% uh, or whatever the, the percentage based on the ongoing mar market rates. And then in fact, we arrived at this 12.86. So uh, these are uh, some of the issues that we took into consideration, but uh, all I would like to do is I have noted these points. So uh, in fact, uh, this needs to be taken into consideration. In fact, when we put this up in, the, the much more policy framework. So thank you very much for your comments and interventions. All as always. In fact, I always take this guiding comments from both of you. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nilanjan. I think with this we should now close. And I would personally like to thank uh, you for your brilliant paper. Congratulations. And I have enjoyed uh, reading it. And especially, uh, uh, I mean, uh, your conclusions are something that I really agree with. 
and uh, thank you so much we have, we had two very distinguished discussants who made some very very important uh, interventions uh, thank you dr varma thank you professor chokra and thank you to the participants who attended and made this um, so interactive thank you so much everybody and goodbye till we come back with the next edition of orf fellow seminar thank you, thank you.